I think the, the last time we talked formally was 29 years ago. Wow. Um, a long like, time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> and when I spoke with you then, um, I had the sense that you had, well, when I called you, it was like talking to someone out of the past. Because I wasn't even sure you still existed. Uh, <laughs> you had disappeared from the movement by then. I did. When did you, um, what were you doing 29 years ago when I, when I first spoke with you? Uh, being a bartender. Right. I'd, uh, I'd done medicine for like five, six years, and um, I was tired. I, I did it all by, I basically, I ran my organization by myself. I was the head of it. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> then all of a sudden, Stonewall happened, and everything wanted to change. And they thought I was very old, because back then I was 32 or 33 years old. And they were 23 years old, and they thought I was old, old fart, and you know, the whole no, nothing was relevant anymore, stuff like that. And uh, and, I, and basically, I was tired, and I wanted out, and I wanted to do something else because uh, I can't do things forever and ever and ever. I want a different lives, and so I always wanted to be a bartender, and I thought it would be a fun thing to do, so I did that. So, um, where did you go to work? Uh, after, after you left Madison, I'm sorry, guys, can I interrupt? Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Dick, after you uh, left Madison, decided you wanted to be a bartender. Where did you, what what bar did you go to work for? Uh, just um, in a gay bar, uh, in, in a gay bar, some on the Upper West Side here. I did that, and I was uh, for a long time. I kept on. I worked for Gay News Letter. As long as I existed, I worked for them. And I did a little bit of gay, gay organization stuff, but gradually I sort of drifted off on that. And uh, I did the bars and did gay bars for maybe 15, 20 years. And then I got into straight bars. And then I became bar managers in restaurants and stuff like that. When, uh, when you were, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you worked in gay bars, did people know who you were or what you'd been involved in? Uh, no. Uh, um, I, didn't, I didn't do the gay thing, no, basically. Well, people knew I was, or sometimes they didn't know I was. You know, it, uh, it slowly, slowly I drafted. I got over it because uh, I knew Lover, and we did things together and all that kind of stuff, and I did the bars. I met all the people who worked in bars. I thought, whole new friend of people, a whole group of people, entirely different other people. And um, I just did it and slowly I sort of drifted away from Madison and and after I went to ten or twelve gay demonstration things, I well yeah, I've seen that, I don't have to go the next time, all that kind of stuff. And I stopped going to them. So um, when Stonewall when the Stonewall uprising started, how did you find out what was going on? How did I? How did you find out what was happening? Was Stonewall happening? Yeah. Oh, well, it Let me start that again. So, so if you can just uh, say back to me, um, how you, just if you can say to me how you found out. If you say, Stonewall, mm -hmm. I heard about Stonewall when? Yeah. My, well, when I joined Madison? No, no. When, oh. you, when you found out about Stonewall. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Um, when it was uh, Saturday evening, and uh, my lover, had bought a ticket for the two of us to go to Europe, and I'd never been on Europe, and hadn't had a vacation in seven years, and so he bought the ticket, and we we're going to go. And we we're leaving on Monday, on on Sunday, and uh, we were packing in, in in my apartment down the street in a block over. We were packing, and uh, and I had the television on, and channel that all news thing on the radio station. It, it was on television, it was on a radio station. And they said there was a gay bar, that there was a gay demonstration going on in the village, and the police were having problems with the gay, with the gay bar down there. And I said, oh, shit, i got to go. And Bobby said, you're not going to go. If you go down there, you'll stay all night long. We'll miss playing this, bitch, bitch, bitch. i got to go. He said, I, you're not going to go. You're going to stay here. I said, i got to go. It's my job. I'm supposed to do it. 
And so I went out and got a taxi and went to the went to the village. To, got a sub, got, a, got the, went down to the village, and they wouldn't get closer to 14th Street. And so I broke that there and I walked down and got got into Stonewall and got right in the middle of it, like walked right into the door of it, and I was there. And I was there for the rest of the week. <laughs> what did you see when you got to Stonewall? Was this on the, the first night of the, of yeah, the uprising? Yes. Yeah, it was the first time it happened. Yeah, it, it was still pretty early in the evening. Too. Things were happening, and everything was going on. It was all exciting and fun, and everybody hanging around and watching and carrying on. And and uh, and it was, um, it, it was it was wonderful. It, it started out, it, it was so... It was so different than it was after that. After, after sun, after Monday, everything everything changed. But the first day, it was it was more fun than anything else. I mean, the the police came in and they were throw they throw, they said they were having a demonstration. They throw people they throw, 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 throw people out, and then they started to come outside, and everybody started yelling and making noises and. And uh, yelling and calling gay, dirty, gay, gay pennies and copper pennies and all that kind of stuff, calling various names and stuff like that. And uh, the cops decided to go back inside. And they, they thought they'd go out the back door. And that's when they found out they didn't have the back door, that they were in there by themselves. And as the story tells you, David tells the story, that the, the uh, police department tried to call headquarters and said, and somebody blocked the, the, the microphone. Didn't work. They said the mafia had done that, and so they were they were stuck inside. And then everything, everybody standing around yelling and carrying on, making fun of the making fun of the jokes of, of, of the police, and making telling them dirty names and stuff like that. But and, and I just sort of mood sort of thing. And then somebody went outside, got the license, uh, what do call license license starter. Uh, uh, Lighter fluid. Flash guard. I put it on the door, and it, it wasn't going to burn the thing down. They, they couldn't have done that, but the cops thought it was going to, and they thought they were on fire. And so they were hysterical. They were inside carrying noise and, and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and then again, it, it went away, and and, uh, and the thing kept just going on and on. And, and it, it stayed, you know, it stayed, uh, Everybody, just everybody standing and chatting and them chatting and, and, and everybody laughing and goofing and crap. And then all of a sudden the vice squad came and they had that thing with the, the famous thing with all everybody lined up, all the tr big trucks of cops, and they all lined up in a row and they came running down like from wall to wall and make everybody move, everybody move, everybody move. And like I said, if, any, if it happened anything else in the whole wide world, it could have happened in Times Square. But Times Square, Everybody starts on Seventh Avenue and goes to Eighth Avenue, and the cops chase you away, and you go around the corner. And when the cop went back, you went back. It took forever to get there, but um, here in the village, because the shorts are small from here to there, so the cop would come down the street at uh, walk down towards towards the north, towards the towards the west, and and they go in, and everybody would run into the car. And as soon as the cops started up again, we come out behind them and follow them back. And then they turn around and come back, and we had to follow back. And it just went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and turned into, it's, it's, you know, very funny. It was, it's just very funny. And it, it went on for an hour. It seems like forever and ever and ever. I guess it, it certainly could have been more than an hour, hour and a half. And, uh, and eventually, everybody kind of got tired of it. And people started disappearing. Disappearing all of a sudden, the cops said, well, everybody's gone, so they disappeared too. And then pretty soon I was there, and, and like everybody else, everybody else seems to have left. It was, it was very late in the night by then, and everybody in the whole world had gone and disappeared. And uh, I, it was the quietest I've ever seen in, in the village. There were no cars, the air had gotten clean, uh, and there was a big old sky up there. And it was just as pretty, the air was so black. It was just so, and there could have been more than five, ten people wandering around down there. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I've never seen a village like this before in my life. And I thought, well, when I go home, I'm going to get so much crap about having been there so long and Bobby trying to get packaged and all that kind of stuff. 
some of us will go to the meat lab to the to the to the trucks to the trucks and see what's going on. And I went to the trucks and everybody in the whole wide world was there because all the cops had gone and they didn't know us. Everybody was running sex all over the place. It's a bizarre, just absolutely wonderful, glorious. And in, that lasted until I went home and, and of course and of course I did get a heart time. <laughs> You didn't go to Europe. I didn't go to Europe. No, the next day, uh, next day I got up. First thing in the morning, I went down to the to the Madison office, and when I was the cops were waiting for me right then, and they said that I came and and when I stopped the demonstration, I said, "Huh, <laughs> me? You're a cop? It's your job to do it." And besides, I've I've been wanting for a demonstration for a thousand years, and it finally happens. So I'm not going to stop it, and. Uh, and anyway, we had a long talk about that, and and and, and uh, I talked to the mayor about it. And the, the mayor called me. I talked to the mayor, all kinds of people. What we're going to do? What we're going to do? What we're going to do? And nobody in the nobody in the nobody in the world knew what we were going to do. I mean, everybody had the day before. The day before Stonewall, nobody wanted to have everybody was. Nobody wanted to do anything. The day after Stonewall, everybody was gay. Everybody wanted to do things. Everybody had an idea of what you should do. And uh, everybody started to think. Some people demanded we should bur burn the place down. Some people said, uh, well, Craig, well, no, um, not Craig, but uh, uh, anyway. Um, anyway, he said, one of, one of the big Madison people, so, uh, he he said, we can't have demonstrations in the village because I've got business down there. Other people have businesses down there. It's going to ruin business for the for the village. We're going to lose all of our business. We've got, we got to stop demonstrations. And everybody else says, no, no, we have demonstrations. So I didn't know what to do. So the only thing I could do, and I, I had to do something. And so I went, got a bunch of, of, of the uh, Episcopal churches around in the village and get, got them to give me space. And I stand and have a speech. Have I come up and talk about what we should do, what we're going to do about things like that? And they did, and oh, it was nasty. Everybody was crazy. Dick, let me just interrupt you. Um, there was a sign that was painted on the the uh, uh, on the wood that was put over the window of yeah. Stonewall on the first floor. Yeah. And let me just read the sign. Um, it said it was painted sign. We homosexuals plead with our people to please help maintain peaceful and quiet conduct on the streets of the village. It was signed Mattachine. Right. Who was behind that sign? Nobody knows. I, I, never, I never knew who said that. I, I never found out any idea who said it. But, uh, I, and I don't know when it happened, because it wasn't there in the morning. Huh. And so there was another sign um, that announced the meeting at St. John's this Wednesday. So right, it was the Wednesday following Stone yeah, the, the right, uprising. Right. Um, was that what happened at that meeting? Did you organize that meeting? What? Did you organize the meeting at yeah, St. John's? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I organized most of those things in the beginning, because like you know, nobody else knew what to do, and and so uh, we had we had the facility to do it. We had paper, make newspaper, com you know, computer stuff like that, and we could get things going. And uh, also, I had I had enough connections with organiz the church with Episcopal churches. That I could get the spaces for to use, and we did it. That one we demonstrated. Well, that one turned into a whole thing between me and uh, what's his name, uh, David, Jim, James, Jim. Oh, Jim Ferrat. Jim Ferrat. Yeah. So can you just say that again? It became yeah. a repeat yeah, the sentence. He tried. He tried to not nominate the whole. He tried to take over the whole thing. He was. Uh, he seems to have been a good friends with. Uh, who was that guy? Uh, from the hippies, yippies, yippies, uh, who want to steal the world, steal the world. Oh. Uh, anyway, he, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, it's all right. So, so steal the, steal the, steal the, his name is, his name is, the book was steal the book. Uh -huh. uh, but anyway, he, uh, uh, Jim, was a, Jim was, a, was a friend of his and wanted to do kind of the same thing. So he, he decided he was, a, he was going to become the Madison version of that, or the gayer version of that. And so he got involved in that. And, uh, and uh, he, uh, it, 
Was that the was that the meeting where Martha Shelley from the Daughters of Belitis also yeah, right, was yeah. there with you? Yeah, that was the other thing that uh, Martha and she, uh, both of them were people who were, hadn't been gay around a long time. I think Jim Jim had been a priest before I think, and got fired for he was gay or something like that, and he hadn't quite completely out yet. It wasn't dealt with it, and every time you saw the two of them. He and Martha, they were always together, every place together. And, and for a very long time, people thought they were boyfriend and girlfriend and stuff. They, they thought they were straight people. They thought they were straight people because of that. Uh, you know, so they were there for that. They were, all, they were always there for everything together. You know. And, and how, did, how did the young people who came to that meeting treat you? Well, like everybody else does, some people thought it was fabulous. Some people thought it was just horrified. You know, really, it was just it was just amazing how people were that, uh, and surprising people. I thought it would be it was wonderful. They thought it was horrible. The what people I thought it was horrible thought it was absolutely wonderful. Was, you know, what did you think uh, about Stonewall and what happened at that time? Well, like I say, I always I've always been in favor of. Uh, I was I was a hippie yuppie, and I was anti-war. I was all that kind of stuff, and uh, I, and I believe in revolution at any time anyway. And so uh, I was certainly in far of it. I tell everybody that um, what's the name of the of the French Revolution? Uh, the, the, who, who ran that? Who ran the who ran the organization? The Russians. The French Revolution or the Ru the Russian Revolution? Yeah, the head of it. Uh, Lenin. Uh, yeah, Lenin. Yeah, yeah. He wanted for he wanted for revolution. He wanted for revolution, and he wasn't there. It, it came, and he had to take a train and catch with it. And I always said the same thing happened to me. I wanted a demonstration, and I never got it. I had to get a taxi and go to it. <laughs> um, how soon after that meeting did you step away from Mattachine, or did you feel like? Oh, it took two or three years. Uh huh. Yeah. So what happened during that period then, when, when the Gay Liberation Front took off and the Gay Activist Alliance what was your relationship like with the people who ran those organizations? Uh, not very good with the first one. That organization was not very good. And a lot of people weren't very pleased with him, with them. Um, but what did they think what did they think of you? How did they perceive you? They didn't like me. Nobody liked me. Nobody liked me. No, because I wanted revolution. And I've been trying trying for seven years for it happen. And so, I or, or, and I did it, or I was there. I, I was there for it. They wanted. They didn't do it, and they're, they're sorry. They you know, they thought me because I did what they should, what they wanted to do, basically. Um, they, uh, the gay organization, the gay organization thing, uh, in, in their newsletter and stuff, they said uh, I, I've had, I had an issue. That, and ask you uh, uh, their editorials where they said, what, what the, um, there was a place on the east side, in the east village, they had a, a disco party, um, a famous. Was it Alternate U? Huh? Alternate U, or was it another place? No, it was, it was, it was one of the old, uh, one of the old uh, uh, music uh, dance things. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, it was the first time I had a gay one. They, they, I got, Right on, right uh, maybe a week or two weeks after Stonewall, they had a demonstration there, and and they raised money for Madison and other people to do it, and they did a show and all that, and this uh, all the that organization, the gay gay, gay liberation the, front, yeah, the gay demonstration, uh, published an article out saying that uh, that 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 dance had been a little. A little a little demonstration about a, a so-called, so-called thing at Christopher Street. However, the party they had, they had two after, after two weeks after that, they got, they all got stoned out. Is what they did, and they went down Sixth Avenue and broke down gar garbage cans and stuff like that. And they said the stone wall and this other thing had been a little prelation pre pre of what the demonstration was going to be. But their organization was the first to step out by itself, and they did it, Dad, Don. 
And, and if you read the newspaper about it, it's hysterical to laugh about it. But so well, they, they were saying, we're the first to do this when yeah, you've been yeah. around for just a few years, yeah, by, exactly, uh, more yeah. than a few years. By right. Yeah. 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 yeah the, thing, and the thing in the first organization, in the first organization, when I got involved there, nobody wanted, everybody wanted to do something about gay life. And they all, and felt this should be done, that the police should be stopped, this should be stopped, the other should be stopped. They wanted to do it, and they loved to do it, but they couldn't. Because in those days, I, I came from Kentucky, and I came all by myself here. I didn't have a relative here in town, and I never had a job where I really cared about a job. I mostly just made money so I could have a good time and things like that. And I did a little crappy little job. If I hated it, I got, took another job and changed it. And, uh, and it meant nothing to me in my life, things like that. But these people have real jobs like teachers and lawyers and doctors and stuff like that. And they wanted somebody to do something, but they couldn't do anything. I can't do it. I can't do it. And also, Mattachine began at, uh, it, it, worked, it worked five days a week, six days a week. It worked from six in the evening to nine in the evening. Everybody else worked nine to five. And I inherited, my mother, my mother died, and I inherited a little bit of money. So I said, why don't we, we can't have a demonstration, we can't have anything going unless we're open during the daytime. Because uh, the, the, the media calls, they wanted to talk to you. There's got to be somebody to talk. There's got to be somebody to answer the telephone. And people read about, we want people to know what gay organization is. Uh, they, the media calls, they wonder, well, what is this matter? You put the organization. Somebody has to answer, and so I'll do it. And so I did. And so, uh, but I said, there again, I said, you know, uh, nobody else could do it. They said, no, I can't. Well, I'm so sorry, I'd love to do it, but I got my job, I got my father, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't. You know, and and I, it wasn't I was, I, it wasn't, I, I wasn't any smarter than anybody else, I wasn't any wiser, anything else. I was just an idiot. I would say, oh, yes, I would. sure, I'll do it. Hell, what the hell, I'll do it. And so I, and that's how I became the star of the whole thing. It, and so people would call in the middle of the night, and I'd say, sure, I'll do it. And I did, and I became the star of it. So, Dick, what, what did everyone else risk? For people who, who, um, who had jobs, who were doctors or teachers, why couldn't they use their names and be a part of Mattachine and speak publicly? What would happen to them? They could lose their job. I mean, um, we, we showed again a lawyer. There, there, were a lot of, there were a lot of lawyers who were gay people, who were gay people, but they wouldn't because they were afraid that the, the, the bar association would fire them because they were gay, which they could do. And uh, when, when we tried to get people to come in and help in traffic and stuff like that, almost invariably, we had to get street people to take care of them because the gay people, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't be seen if they have part of it. I'll be connected with it. And, so um, how many of the people in Mattachine um, actually used their real names? This is now in the 1960s, before Stonewall. Uh, were you the only person at Mattachine in New York who used no, his name? No, we were, we were proud of the fact. We had, I think we had, we had maybe 300 members, but most of them just paid money. Uh, but uh, the volunteer people, uh, there were usually, there were usually maybe 20 people, uh, they would do things. And they uh, read your newsletter, sat in the office and talked to people, had conversations with people who came in and talked to the, the gay organization. Uh, uh, when we had demonstrations, some of them would go with demonstrations with us. Mm -hmm. And they were always very small, but, uh, but they would go with it. And, and they tried as best as they could do it. But like I say, they, they could have had reasons they couldn't do it. Were you in the office when Craig Rodwell came in one day? More than more than one time. Well, the first of the, of the, <laughs> were you there the, the first time Craig Rodwell came in? Huh? Well, that's how I found Madison. I, it was, I, my lover. I didn't have a lover anymore, and I become. A, I didn't have boyfriend I, for a long time. I was like little little boyfriend, the, the me and my little lover kind of stuff and all that. And after a couple of years, he broke up, or we broke up. And so I was just going around sleeping around like everybody else does. And it was cold. God, it was cold in February. And I was horny. I went outside looking for a hustler or, or somebody somewhere. And there was nobody out on the damn street. And there was Craig Rodwell. I ran into him. 
And so we end up with two cells that had sex. And um, we became kind of friends. And uh, uh, I'd call and so go, I oh, can't I go to the Madison Society. You know? I said, what's the Madison Society? And he told me about that was. And I said, oh, that's nice. And so I went to the Madison Society. And I thought it was a ditz. I thought it was nothing was going to happen to it. Um, it's, it seemed like nothing was, nothing was becoming. Julian Hodges was head of it. And he was great. He was wonderful. And, and had all kinds of great ideas and, and did fantastic things while he was around and all that kind of stuff. But the rest of it was all ditz. I thought, oh, God, this is a waste of time. But I became friends with Craig, uh, with uh, him, the, pre the president, and uh, we used to have dinner a lot together and stuff like that. And uh, he would go with me and Craig, or Craig and me, and, uh, and he would take us to dinner and stuff. And, um, and so I sort of hung out with them. And then, um, and then he threw all kind of, it's a tough story about how it, but anyway, it happened that um, he couldn't, the way the organization was set up, uh, you couldn't follow, you couldn't reproduce yourself. And it was, he, and Julius's turn was running out. And so he was trying to become somebody to be the head of organization of it. And uh, he suggested that I do it. I said, I, I know nothing about it. I, 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 I've never done a thing like that in my life. I don't know anything about stuff like that at all. I can't do it. And he said, oh, you got to do it, Jan. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, well, you go ahead and do it. And I'll go on doing what I'm doing. And all you have to do is call yourself the president. And you, <coughs> and you have to sign things and use your pictures. And I'll do all the work that I'm doing right now. I said, hell, I can do that. That's easy. And so we started doing that. So Dick, why? What, uh, what interested uh, you about the work of the organization that you would agree to become the yeah. president? Uh, because uh, everything. I have to be in charge of everything. And I'm, like I said, I'm not in charge of anything. And I didn't want to be in charge of anything. I, I just wanted to play and have a good time. And uh, so anyway, so Julian took the job. I mean, Julian went on doing, he was running the organization. I was just sitting there smiling, and, and he was paying dinner. And sometimes we had watched it. Sometimes we'd go to the baths together. <laughs> but, uh, and then I'd have to sign, I'd have to sign things. And then he lost his job and had some problems with that and couldn't get another job. And so he decided he was going to move to Virginia. And so he called me and said, guess what? And I said, what? He said, you're head of the Madison Society. I said, yeah, I know I am. He said, no, I mean, you really am. Because I'm leaving town. I've got to go. He said, you're, t you're taking over the organization. I don't know anything about an organization. Well, I'm in charge. You're in charge of it. You still took the job. You're in charge for it. And so I did what I could do. And we had a board of trustees who were gay people, I've never met gay people, straight people, like uh, uh, people from uh, Julia, from um, Wardell Pomeroy, from Kansas Institute, people like that, law, uh, psychologists, doctors, lawyer, clergy people, that kind of people, who believed in the organization, but weren't members and stuff like that. And they give us information. And so I did what I could. I said, look, hey, I've got this job. I'm in charge of it. I don't know what I'm doing. I have to know this. I'm just a plain little cocksucker, you know. That's all I know. I don't know about intellectual, all this kind of stuff. I can't do it. Help me. And so they did. They were very nice. They all took me aside. They gave me conversations, hours after hours after hours. They took me around showing leather bars, book bars, all kinds of bars, things like that. And I learned. I learned about gay life and learned about the whole thing. I mean, because you know, like in the organization, the, the drag queens hated the leather queens, and the leather queens hated the drag queens. And all, or thought they were tacky and all that kind of stuff. And I, my function was to try to get everybody in jail to make the whole thing. And I did. I did the best I could to, to, and, uh, and, and try to do the whole thing. And what was, what was the goal then? Once you, once you uh, wrapped your mind around what's, what, that you were president of the Madison Society, did you have specific goals for, for well, the organization? Well, yeah. Well, we had uh, we ran a meeting once, uh, once a month with an ad in the Village Voice <coughs> where we're trying. Because one thing was to get people to talk about homosexuality, because nobody did. And most people didn't know what homosexuality was. To, to, first, you had to tell them what it was. Because 
people would say homosexuals are illegal, and it, well, that's distressing. And you know what is it? Well, I don't know what it is, but it's distressing. And so we had to do that. And so we we had this demonstration where we did, where we talked about that. And in the beginning, when I got involved there, almost everybody there were all psychologists, and and they're the kind of psychologists who thought you could help gay people. Because there used to be a liberal thing here because every, everybody thought. Everybody thought gay homosexuals are going to go to jail, should be put in jail, should be put in psychology, put in dead if you're if you're Christian, all that kind of stuff. And somebody said, no, if we can help them, if we can help homosexuals stop being homosexuals, it'd be good. It's a it's a wonderful thing for us. And so the psychologist was, everybody thought that was a, that, that was a, that was a stage. I thought that was not far enough. I thought homosexuals. Homosexuality is not sickness at all whatsoever. And we talked about that. Anyway, the first people were psychologists. And I said, no, no, we can't do that. We have better stuff. So I tried different organizations to come and talk, get plays, and people write, uh, write uh, movie stars, uh, people, yeah, and, and anything that has something to do with homosexuality to talk. So we all talked. So that, that's one of the things we did. And, did. and then in the organization, everybody had this other issue. That they're, they're, um, Somebody had written a gay, a gay book. Uh, somebody had written a gay book about religion, and so <coughs> we used him, and we got a, or, an organization for a gay group, and we tried to get priests, uh, Romans, to Jews, Christians, any kind, any kind, any people connected with religion, come and talk about homosexuality, and we get groups to talk about what various religion talks about sexuality, and all. Roman Catholics came, and so we it was good to be. You know, it, it's, it's, it's hell to go to all that kind of, but you can be confession, as long as you're a confession, it's all right, and stuff like that. And, and they explain how they talked about it, and, and the other people. And, and the same thing with other classes, uh, we did that. Dick, did, did you have any trouble getting people to, to come, uh, like the yes. priests and the... Uh, the biggest one we had was, well, no, most of it, well, it depends on how liberal they were. Uh, you know, certain classes, you, Right. Well, yes, of course, we'd love to do it. Other classes, no, we don't really want to do it. Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic good turned out to be very nice. He, he was a, that's when they had Vatican II, the big, one of the people who was there was a rector up, uh, up by Columbia. And he, and he was, and so he came and he would tell, he dealt with us very good with his people like that. How many people came to the to the meetings there? It depended on who we taught, but usually, sometimes you get hundred people. Uh, sometimes, sometimes you got very big and they fill the whole place. There was a, the woman who wrote. Uh, there were two women who wrote newspapers, all the all 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 the newspapers. There were two women writing all the. Everybody wrote interviews, but there's two ladies that were the, were the were the big. People in Manhattan. One was New York Magazine, and, and the other was the one that looks like it. And she was and she was funny. She was campy, and uh, I saw her on, tele on her things on television, and I could tell by her tone that she was hung out with gay guys, and she was funny and stuff like that. So I wrote her a letter and said, "If there's one thing that a homosexual likes better than Betty Davis, it's um, what's her name." It's, it's her, it's her re re interview of that, and she she called me up. I'm coming, I'm coming. I want to talk to you. And she came. We had like five times there. It packed the whole place. It was so crowded that one person fell down the strips and, and died from from the group. There was so excited, and we did very well with that. So and so besides the the monthly meetings, mm -hmm. what else? Did did Manashin do? What was the goal of the organization? Well, uh, uh, every uh, well uh, about uh, police entrapment. Try to do something about that. Can and you describe? Because there are people who have no idea what that is. Can you give a typical example of how the police would try to entrap gay men? En what is police entrapment? Uh, police entrapment is somehow or another. I don't know when it happened, uh, but it was certainly. It, certainly, at the, at the time of bro prohibition, some prohibition, uh, it was there. There was a, a city, a, a group, in, in uh, the police department that uh, was the pe people from being disorderly, and 
and they were they were their job was to uh, uh, stop homosexuality, prostitution, gambling, drugs, uh, ga uh, c uh, communism, nasty things like that. And it's their job to go out and find these people and put us in jail for doing that. And not put us in jail. Basically, they give us basically they give us to a, a big fine for doing it. And uh, <coughs> And so if you're going to do that, how do you do it? And you can't wear a uniform because everybody's going to know you're a cop or a prostitution or a gambler. So you've got to wear plain clothes. And you have to do it in the evening because that's when things like that generally happen. And you also have to go out and uh, go places where they hang out, which means you have to hang out in bars and gambling places and stuff like that. So the government, the government has to give you plain clothes, send you out to do this, give you money to spend. Now, how do they know that you don't take the money and go home and go to sleep and dead dead or go out to, to the bar and drink bar, drink the gambling yourself? It's where you have, so they decide that what, the way you do that is you give them a qualification. You have to make a number of, 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 of rests every month. And if you don't, out, out. You got to do it. And so what happened was as a, as the situation got on and on, uh, they didn't have their quali they didn't make they didn't they didn't meet their qualification, so they go out and lie, or they cheat, and they say they don't. And you go in and you say you're arrested for homosexuality. And you say, I didn't say anything for you. Well, that's all right. It's between me and the cop. It's your voice against his, and it worked that way a lot of times because they just go ahead and take the thing the the, uh, the cop's word for it. And stuff like that. So they would go. In, so they'd go into a gay bar, mm -hmm. and they would they would just grab someone and say, "You're well, under arrest." Or well, usually, usually, they tried to go someplace where, where gay people were, where gay people were cruising, uh, where you're cruising on the, on the street. It's just all the talk. On, it was against the law to ask on the street to have sex, and so uh, on Christopher Street, when you walk back and forth and cruise back and forth all the time, you, those days you walk very carefully. If you were by yourself, well, you, usually you hang out with friends and you have somebody else around. You go in couples so that they keep an eye on somebody else. So if you talk to somebody, uh, they could know what they said or heard what they said and so have a conversation. But if they try to get busted, you say, no, I was there, that lawyer and I said that. And, but you walk along, the, or if you're by yourself, you walk along the street and you walk along the street and you look back and turn around, walk back forth this way, and turn around this way, and look around on it, send your friends and stuff like that, keep walking, looking for somebody, and you see somebody you like, and you look at him, you kind of give him a look, and he gives you, and you kind of give him a look, and you walk over and you find a window, and you stand there and go, look at the shoes, you stand and look at the shoes, and he stands and looks at the shoe over there, and they sort of walk towards you, and he stands and he looks next to the window too, and y'all look at the same window. And you go, well, that's kind of nice. And you start a conversation that way. And you, you start it very carefully to see what he's going to say next. Because, and wait for, and then you hope that it turns out that it's not a cop that's told you something. And that's how, that's how you cruised in those days. What, what would happen if, if it turned out to be a cop? Then they tell you, we're taking you away. And you ought to have spent night. You, ought to, you have to spend night over, over town, had, 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 to in, had to stay in the police all night, and the next day, you go to you get out and you uh, pay a call for you pay. Um, well, well, you could pay the whole thing. You you could, you could say I'm guilty, and give him I think it was twenty, I think it was fifty dollars. You gave him that, and you qualify. Except you had a record, and that was a bad issue for many people because a lot of places, uh, they they follow that. They, and uh, or, or, or if you look to be a school teacher or, or a priest or something like that, they always look to do a thing. And oh, he's got a homosexual thing. Forget you're you're not fired. Or they'll fire you right on the spot. You're a homosexual. And so why focus on the entrapment issue and not on issues of discrimination in employment or military or marriage? Why was entrapment such an important why issue? What? Why was entrapment such an important issue? I don't know. Well, because because they had the job, that was their job. The cops did. No, no. no the question is, and and you should 
you should you need to sit back. I can't they they need you to sit back in your seat. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll speak louder. Um, you know, why was it important for Manashim to get involved with the issue of entrapment? Why not focus on something like discrimination in the military or something else? Well, we did that too, but I, I made that was I made that an issue for me. I thought that was very important because I thought there was you'd never be able to have a gay or we're never able to have a gay organization unless we have a place where you can hang out. And there's no place in the whole entire world then where gay people could hang out. Uh, you can't, you can't, there's no gay church, there's no gay group at, at the church, there's no gay group at, at school, no gay, any place you can go, there's no gay place where you hang out because the police are going to come in and trap you. Or if you're, if you go to school and the, the, and the and the teacher finds out that you're homosexual, they put you in the, and they put you in, in the what the the, the uh, doctor the, what do you call it the psychiatrist uh, yeah they they they're gonna send you to your mom and say he's homosexual you should help him stuff like that there's no place you and there's no place to hang out except in bars you can't go in if that's why that's why bars got invited too because bar the bar is one place. And they're every place in the whole wide world. And any place where you go to a strange town and you're gay by yourself, all by yourself, you can find a gay some, someplace by yourself. You could go in there and immediately you'll know somebody. I mean, you'll become friends immediately. If you're from out of town and you want help, if you're looking for a job, then maybe they'll help you find it. If you need a place to live, they may find you help to it's, it's some, the only place in the whole wide world. It's what it's what black what or what what religion is to black people. Is is look is is to gay bars. Dick. Yes. So um, you had made a comparison um, between churches and gay bars. Can you just repeat what you said before? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I was saying you know that uh, um, there's no place in the whole wide world. Uh, it's all. Where gay people have organization, where, where gay can meet together, where there's a gay church, a gay school, gay theater, no place to gay place where gay people can hang out. All they do is try to stop you from being homosexual, find reasons why you can't be homosexual. And the only place in the whole wide world that gay people can feel comfortable is in bars. You go to a bar, where there's bar, gay bars all over the place. Maybe a full gay bar, maybe a half gay bar. There's a gay place every in the whole wide world. There's gay bars that you can go into. You walk in there, you're a total stranger you've never seen before in your life. You don't know where you are. You go in there, you're gay, they're gay. You got one thing combination right there. You got somebody to talk to. They might be cute. You might have sex with them. You might just be interesting. You have a good time with them. Um, if you need a place to live, maybe they can find you a job and give some idea. If you need a place to live, maybe they find you a place to live or or help you find a place to live. Anything you know, gay people will help together and become part of the group and, and thing. And so in effect, it's the only place in the world where all the racist, all the, all the horrible people can be together people. It's like, it's like a black organization where, where, the, where, where you go to the church. The church is the one free place where everybody can be, everybody does the same thing, it's all, that's real life. And, and that's why gay bars, but gay bars became but gay bars and, and, and police entrapment became the issue to me. Other people had you know, Washington D.C. They wanted to fight getting 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 jobs for the federal government. I, I wasn't care about that particularly. Uh, the other organizations they were against church or against that. Uh, that's not that's not important to me. To, important to me is the gay organization forming a communion, a gay a, one place where gay people can go. For, for a communion, basically for a, com a community. And uh, you can't have that if the police are against you, if everything else. It's the only, pl it's the only place like that. And that, that was the important thing to me. And that was Manichine. So how did you co come up with the idea, or, or how did you know how to fight entrapment? What, what, did you lay out a roadmap? Did you have examples of how to do this? Well, no, everybody knew about it because uh, Everybody knows about it. Everybody knew about that. Everybody knew about entrapment. Everybody knew the whole system was corrupt, as corrupt as it could be. The lawyers knew, the ledger's law, everybody knew it. But 
it's always been, so it's the right thing to do because of its history, you know. So, uh, and, and uh, people got arrested, and they were proud of it. I mean, when the cops couldn't, when, the co when, when, when the people were on, on trouble with the police because they had gambling and stuff like that, uh, and, uh, and they thought the cops weren't doing anything, they're going to attract more gay people, and they put an ad in the paper how, how many people were, um, how many people were, were trapped. Um, anyway, I, I would do that now. Uh, anyway, they did that, and um, so Dick, and so uh, so so, and they talked about it, and so I talked about it, and also we put out leaflets. We made um, I, Madison, I made a leaflet, like our lawyer made a leaflet, a little piece of paper that fell that 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 big and, and three pages, and it told you, if you're if you're arrested by the police, don't say you're guilty. Say you're not guilty, go to the your jail, and wait for the trial, and we'll try to find you a lawyer. We'll so, so get somebody to try to help you. Because we're fighting this, we want to stop it. And the only way to stop it is to fight against it. And we pass these things all every place. And everybody, everybody could put them in a little pocket and remember what it was and stuff like that. And uh, the media got involved in it. And in those days, what's the right-wing newspaper now? It used to be the left bridge. The, the, Post. Voice, huh? the Post. The Post. Right. Oh, right. uh, excuse me. I can't remember my names. I've been writing. James James Wischler was the editor of that, and he was a he was a very liberal sort of man. He uh, he's a very historic person too, but he was the editor of that thing, and so he did an issue once five, a five piece thing about homosexual about sexuality duality. And there's a picture of me. I, I write about homosexuality. I have a picture of Madison in it and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I, he, 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 wasn't, he wasn't the editor who wrote it. He was the editor of the place. But anyway, I met him and in the street, and I, and I interrupted him about the article. He, he saw the article. He told me it was very good. And so we started chatting. And I started talking about it. And I said uh, that we're involved in the Madison Society. And we're fighting against it. He said, he knows about entrapment and you know, how awful it is. And I said, well, we're fighting for it. He said, well, what can you do about it? And I said, well, the only thing we can do is tell people to fight against it. And in those days, you know, how a telephone has a, a place that has telephone rooms, and you, you can, you're telling this person and so it's all the other thing. I said, and so what we do is also when um, the cops didn't work all the time, they they took it easy, and they did nothing. Half the, half the month, they do nothing. Last week, they, they were inter, inter, arrest everybody, right and left. Oh, my God, I missed my time. Oh, my Jesus, it's time. So they start calling everybody, putting everybody in jail. And so we could see what was happening because people called us because we asked them to. And the first part of the month, nobody called. All of a sudden, of the month, everybody's calling, getting arrested. I said, and he said, well, what can you do about that? And I said, well, why don't you get... A, a newspaper, and you come down to the Madison office on these days when this happens, this time of the country when it happens. And so I'll, I'll sit there, and when people call up and say, I got, a, I got an entrapment, and, and I want a police to come and help out, and I'll ask them to tell their story. And, they'll, and you can listen on the thing to what the story is. And, they, and then you go back and see the interview if you want to do that. And they say, oh, that's a great idea. So we did, and we sat there, and it worked, and we sat there. And one after one after another, people calling all just exactly the way I said it was going to be. And so um, their big diva, their big uh, star there was their famous editorial was their diva. And he wrote a big article about that, two, three, three, three articles about it. The other people in that thing wrote about it too, how wonderful it was. And so all of a sudden, Mary Lindsay came and said, no, we're not going to have police entrapment. This is not going to happen. We're going to stop it. Because that, that, that punched the run. That's what really, well, it didn't really punch it. What happened was, as it, as it happened, uh, John, John Lindsay came and said, entrapment is not going to happen ever, 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 ever again. Well, it just so happens that on that night, at the same time he was saying on television, saying at this meeting we had in the village, talking about that. The same night that was happening, somebody had trapped a policeman. 
and he got and he, a clergyman, and his his boss was a clerg another clergyman who knew John Lindsay. So John Lindsay called in the middle of the night and said, "Hey, you know what you said? Well, they got another one going." So they had another meeting where the police came to the property. And the, the police says they are not doing this. Never, ever, ever, ever. They have to happen again. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they did. And that, incidentally, the man who uh, who the, who was in charge of all that, um, John, um, he turned out to be a good guy. He was just a dumb guy. He didn't know about all that kind of stuff. And the situation. That's what he had always done all of his life. But when he, when he got burned on Lindsay on that, he felt very bad. He was about to lose his job. He was, still, he was afraid of. And also, I, I chatted him and talked to him and told him things like that. And anyway, we became friends and I started so, talking with him. So, um, so did the entrapment actually stop? Or no, did it go it, on for it, a while? The police entrapment did, yeah. It, it, it still happens occasionally. It's, and even now, it still happens occasionally. But when it does happen, it happens very seldom, and it stops because because it is nasty, it's corrupt. It's so how how did you come up with the idea of uh, of, of these um, papers that you folded over that had that had information about what to do in the event you were entrapped? Did you come up with that idea? Did someone else come up with that idea? Uh, I, 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 well, it was my idea to make it, but our lawyer made it. We got him to do it for us. And, well, well, I, we wrote it together, basically. But, but uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I wouldn't do it myself. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, uh, the first time we had the little button like that was, uh, that's the first connection we had, which, uh, which uh, we were trying, trying to get our, our connection with the, with the governor, with, with any, any politician. And nobody would ever answer our letters until John Lindsay. Uh, but uh, at the time, uh, syphilis and gonorrhea became a problem at the B, B, at the clinic down on Ninth Avenue where the, where everybody goes for that, and it was a really serious problem. And so they came and said, "Can you do something about it?" And we said, "Well, what?" And they suggested we write a little letter like that, what to do about sexuality, what about that. And so we that's the first time we gave gave all that kind of stuff out. And so this seemed like the next thing to do. And then after that, we also did a thing about how how to, uh, uh, if, yeah, if they want you to go to Vietnam, how to tell them you're homosexual so that you don't have to go to jail. We did, we did a little book for that too. And we, we had a whole bunch of series we bring over about people. So in, a, in an average month, hmm? how, in an average month during those years, in the 1960s when you were at Mattachine, how many calls would you get um, that last week of the month? How many calls might you get in a night from people who had been, been trapped? Well, it depended on how busy they were. Um, Five calls, ten calls? Yeah, more. Usually more of that. Usually sometimes ten or twenty. Yeah. And then what would you do when you got a call? Well, what we would do, we, we told them that, uh, that we don't have money. We don't have money to pay their way. But uh, we'll try to get volunteers to do them. And we had some volunteers who would help. And... Like I said, there were, there were two women and a man, a gay man, and the two women were not gay. Uh, but they, um, they, 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 had, they had a career for doing that. Everybody called the, 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 the people that uh, had done that, that's what they did for a living all their lives, basically. And uh, we stayed away from them because they were making money out of it. And we tried to get other, other people to help. And we were very lucky in that um, uh, I can't I can't tell you his name because I can't remember. His name. Let me tell you his name. Um, I was at the yeah. I was at uh, um, I was at uh, the person was Madison back then, and I was with him. And we went to the uh, oh, YMCA uh, after. You need to p put the papers aside. Hmm? The, the papers need okay. to go back. It's just, it changes the light. Oh, OK. Sorry. I can't say it then. But anyway, okay. um, after, um, okay, anyway, um, uh, Julian Hodges and I hung out together. And he was the head of the Madison Society. And I was, was working there. And it was 
It was four blocks away from the from the baths, from the uh, gymnasium, from the bath, and uh, at 28th Street, the one that burned down. Everard. Huh? Everard. Yeah, over there, right. Uh, and we went there one night, and uh, we got our clothes off and run around, do what we usually do. And I went back, and Julian was there with this man who was not attractive at all. And I, what's that all about? And so I go doing what I'm doing, and I come back, he's still with this guy. And I go someplace else, and I come back, and he's still there with the guy. I go, wow. I don't know, it looks like he's in love. It looks like he's in love, but he's not even attractive. Wow. And so he was there the whole evening, the whole night we were there. And uh, next morning when it was time to go, uh, he left. And I said, what the hell was that all about? You and him. And he, oh, John Lasso. John Lasso. That's it. Not John Lasso. That was his name. And, John, and I said, well, who's that? And John Lasso uh, is connected with the Episcopal Church. He's a lawyer. Uh, he's, uh, he was a big black that people with the gay or the, the black movement thing with all the famous people and stuff like that. He was a gay guy who liked black guys uh, and white guys too. But, black, but anyway, he had, black, he had black lovers and stuff like that. And he was a partner with two other people in this white, uh, white shoe uh, thing, uh, church. And so he, t he spent that whole night talking to Craig, uh, to Drew, to, to Drew about Mattachine. And we got to do something about this. We got to do something else. We got to do something about this. And he got he got involved, and he got his two partners to involved in it. And so that all of a sudden, we started going to demonstrate when uh, and he, he when people would get arrested. So we had people who would go down up here there, and they that 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 courtroom down there was all prostitutes and junk, you know, uh, tacky people. And all of a sudden, these guys are walking in their white coats and they're and organizing and asking asking questions. Well, what exactly exactly what you do? The one thing is that the when the police department when the, when the when the cop comes in, he has to take a he has to be there when the when the on the day of his trial and says what happened. And so uh, the lawyer came in and he says uh, the cop comes in and he sits there and, and the judge says it was, tell you your story, and he said well. I did pick up a homosexual man, and his name is so and so, and he did this, 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 and he did this. And the other guy said, I did not. He said, I did so, I did so, I did so. And the judge said, took the, said maybe, maybe said to, said to the judge, so, look, you're guilty. And so he has to pay us 50 bucks or go to jail, whatever. And so that is, this is Frank, the, the lawyer's name is Frank in that one. And Frank, uh, had to wait like two or three or four, however long, for the next trial. And he comes back as the same cop and, and with another thing. So uh, he stands up there and they're talking. And the, the guy stands just, and I picked up a homosexual man. He did this, he did this, he did this, he did this, he did this. And so they had a decision and they decided who was going to be guilty and who wasn't going to be guilty. And there was a third person with both the same cop and the same judge, the same um, lawyer. And so they stand up, and so the cop stands up uh, some time back. The cop stands up and says, I picked up a homosexual, and he did this and this and this and this and this. And Frank says, excuse me, uh, Your Honor, he said, I, we, can't go back, we shouldn't go back to the other classes. He said, but we came to this cop three times a day, and I would like you to stand up and read the thing he said to each of these things. And the judge got up and read it. It made him stand up and read it, and he was saying exactly the word to word to word to word to word, and so that cop was struck over, <laughs> and that's how that's how we got things done. So you found so so the president of Manichine found a lawyer at the baths who worked for a white shoe law firm, mm -hmm. and got his partners to sign on to the idea of helping gay people. Mm -hmm. Who paid for those lawyers then? For what? Who paid? for those lawyers. They, they volunteered. So they did this pro bono. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was worth it for him to spend the whole night at the baths with yeah. this guy. Yeah. What, 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 what you call, what, what you call, what, you have to just do some work for no charge. Pro bono. Yeah, they did it for pro But they wouldn't do like, when we were doing, when we were doing the bars, they wouldn't do it then. 
they always they're, they're always charged. Okay, so that's a, qu a question I have for you. The your your best known or most famous for what came to be known as the the SIP in. Right. What were you what were you trying to do when you planned this event to challenge uh, the state law that made it illegal to serve known homosexuals? What were you trying to achieve in that? It just seems so good sense, so sensible. Like I said, you, you have to have some place to go hang out. Basically, that was the whole thing. You had to have some place to go out. And the bars where you hang out. Gay bar was, gay bar was our life, like I said earlier. That's our, our, our life. And we, and we can't have them close these places. If that's close, what do we do? Where do we go? We gotta do it. And uh, the city of New York uh, not only had the police involved then, but also the liquor authority was in it. And they wanted to do, this is illegal, this is illegal. You got to show power for one reason or another. Sometimes just because if you, they would try to, they would, the liquor authority would try to close the bar in, unless they gave them money, unless they could make, okay, that's corrupt too. Every, in New York, everything is corrupt. <laughs> and a lot of that was plenty of corrupt and all that kind of crap. And uh, it was a situation. And anyway, it came to the point where bars, when a bar, when, 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 if you went, if you went a pickup in Central Park and had sex with somebody or were accused of having sex, it was your problem. If you did someplace that was your problem. If you do something in a liquor authority, then the place becomes disorderly. And then the liquor, then the liquor people get into it. And if, if you go in and you get arrested for prostitution, or you get uh, entrapped, or if, if they're, they're picking you for sex, and they fire you for having for having sex or for asking sex or asking for sex even, uh, then the liquor bar gets closed too. And so when you get in tr when you got arrested like like the, when you get entrapped, um, you got to go to court and stay for a week, and it takes three days, maybe a month before you have a law. They can't close the bar then because they have you have to prove that it's guilty, and so. The bar would be in interim, waiting and finding out whether they're going to throw out, whether you're going to lose your job or you're not going to lose your job, basically. And so that was really so. So they did the sensible thing. Judges did. I mean, the uh, uh, bars did the sensible thing. They put little signs out front saying, "If you're gay, don't go away," or "We're friends who are gay, but don't come in, please," because they knew the situation. Everybody knows the situation. And there was this bar on Christopher, and there was this bar on. British Avenue, they had a sign up front saying, if you're gay, stow away. And so Craig and, and, and John and I decided, we got to do something about that. Now, what can we do about it? So we looked at our, our lawyers, and our lawyers said, well, the issue is that um, you can't do a demonstration, and you can't do a medium with television or stuff like that, because a bar, a, a person who runs a bar has to keep the place disorderly, <laughs> has, to be, has to be good, good manners. And if you have demonstrations and stuff like that, that makes the place automatically noisy and it's distractive. And so you got to be very quiet, very carefully. And so we just got three people, and we went to the, we go to go to a bar, and we were going to ask for a drink, and and give them a sign saying we're a gay organization. We know it's against the law to do that, but we want to be served anyway. Will you serve us drink? And so this place had to stand out front. So we decided we were going to go on noon and do that. And so being late, we were late. And we go into the New York Times, it's already there. We, we only brought the New York Times, the Village Voice, uh, three, three newspapers, and one photograph. And that's all we, disorderly, to be orderly. And so, uh, so the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, cop, the, the mayor got there early. At the, 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 the media got there early and before us, and they walked in the door and said, hey, so what's your mother's gay demonstration out there? Nah, nah, nah. The what? Oh, my God, what? Yeah. So they closed the place. It wasn't open that day. So we showed up. The place is closed. So, and they said, what you going to do, guys? I said, um, well, in a lot of gay situations, a lot of love bars, they all know the situation, so we go to another one. So we went to this other one, which is notorious mock, mock, mock a police sort of place, and we go in and, and we sat down and said we were gay, we wanted to get a sandwich or something to drink, 
and uh, something to, liquor, to, liquor, to drink liquor and would they serve us? And they said, sure. Yes. I don't you want illegal. Uh, and so we'd get the manager and this big old mafia comes down, big old guy. Says, What's going on here? And we tell our little situation. He says, hell, how do I know they're homosexuals? Give them what they want out of them for free. And so we ate and we drank and, and this was the media and uh, didn't have a meeting. So we went to another place, the Julia, to uh, another bar. And the same thing happened. We go back and we try to get demonstrate, try to get rejected, and they called the mayor and uh, the, the boss. And the boss turned out to be a dishwasher. I think he was very dirty old whites. And he came out and he said, "Good God! Everybody in Albany is gay. They wouldn't try to make a law like that. Give them what the hell they want." So they got it again too. We're standing on the street with nothing to drink, no no, no decision, and all that kind of stuff. Then what are we gonna do next? And we said. Well, we don't want to go to Julius's, but Julius, because Julius has gotten arrest, had, had a gob, got a cut, and it's likely they were going to be closed, and all we were going to do was make more trouble for them, and we didn't want to make any trouble for them whatsoever, but we, have, we were desperate, we had a situation. So I walked in, and we said, um, our little situation, we wanted to drink, and in those days, most peop most, more people seemed to drink hard liquor, and it was set up the way when you sat in, when you came in and sat down, the bartender put, put, put a glass right in front of you and say, gentlemen, what will you have? And tell them it's gin and tonic. All right, and so they, they would reach over, they'd bring the ice and put it over there, and they'd bring the gin and put it over there, bring the scotch over there, bring the drink, and, and do it right in front of you. And so we came walking in, we told them about a little sad story, they were going to be homosexual. Bang, he put a glass right over the door and said, we did, it wasn't planned. He put the glass, he said, I'm sorry, I can't serve you. Fantastic, we had everything we wanted. And so we, we had to go sue. And uh, we went and sued, and the liquor authority said that they, we had never discriminated in New Jersey. After, we had after bar parties, and nasty after parties too, a lot of times. And we wanted to get them, but they kept closing them, and they kept closing them. And what happened was, there was a, a famous, sto famous story about the, what was it called, the snake? The snake, the snake pit. The snake pit wherever they came in, and they, they came in, and, for sure, they sh and they just came in and, and, and had, had the uh, arrest in the middle of the night. You should do it early in the evening. If you were you, you, if it's always a mistake to do it late at night. We did it a late night in the bar, and uh, because it wasn't after bars, bar, so it would be late at night. Uh, they did this thing, and so there's this guy who was foreign from someplace else, and he was scared, he was afraid he was gonna be thrown out, so he jumped out the window, and it was, Outside, there was a window of, of iron thing out there, and he landed on the belly with, and the, night, the things went into his belly, and he couldn't, they couldn't get him out. And he laid there for maybe an hour or so, and they took the machine, of, they took the, the, the pins against him and dragged him to, to the hospital with, this, with, with the thing hanging out of his belly or something, and everybody in town saw it, and it was on the media and stuff like that. And so after that, there were, for a very long time, the gays wouldn't, the gay wouldn't touch even Ill illegal parties because they were afraid what were, how many more people were going to die or something like that was going to happen in how office. So for a long time, for about five years, ten years, uh, there was no law for liquor, basically. So, so the, the, the snake pit uh, raid uh -huh. led to uh, an end for a while uh -huh. of, of the raid. So I, I have some, some side questions for you, and then I want to move way ahead in time. Um, did you know Harvey Milk? Did I know him? Did you know Harvey Milk? Yeah, I knew him not very well. How did you meet Harvey Milk? Or can you just say, I met Harvey Wil Milk when? I think I knew him through Craig. Mm -hmm. Craig wanted to be lovers with him, and he didn't want to be lovers with Craig. And uh, so he tried. But anyway, he hung out with him. And he was around. I, I sort of knew him. I didn't know him very well. And uh, he... Not, not long after I knew him, he decided to move to San Francisco. So I didn't know much of him. Okay. There were a lot of people I didn't know. I didn't know Julian Hodges. I said I used to take him out to dinner with various people. And uh, a friend of his, I can't, I can't remember his name, was an artist. And he knew all kinds of people. And he would invite dinner with us too. And twice he brought um, the white hair. The. Uh, Huh? Andy, Andy Warhol? Yeah, Harley, he met Harley. 
and he was here twice. And, and Julia said, don't buy him dinner anymore. He's so boring, he has nothing to say, no conversation. So I never saw him again. <laughs> uh, so, so now, all these years later, Dick, so here we are, it's 2018. And looking back to when you were first involved with Mattachine as the president, um, what do you think your, your biggest accomplishment was uh, as, as the head of the Mattachine? Well, I think stopping police entrapment and the bars, making, making it possible to have a group, have a, have, to be you know, a, communi a community. I thought that was the most important thing. Uh, because when I was a kid, you know, uh, in, back in the, in the 50s, in the, in the early 60s, there was no community, none whatsoever. And in school and church, all that, no, no, I mean, we knew, uh, made a, but we didn't talk about it. You know, we, we had, at school we had gay friends and stuff like that, but we didn't, nobody knew the group. But a lot of people knew because we all sat in the same group and, mm -hmm. and we were, half of us were all camping anyway. <laughs> and had, had more class than the straight people did, so they knew we were gay. <laughs> so there was a, a long period during which you were forgotten. People didn't know of your contributions. When were you rediscovered? When was I? Rediscovered. When I was rediscovered? Oh, uh, well, I say it's been a long time. I kind of dropped off the machine. I did, I did a bunch of, I did bartender and I did other work and I changed a couple of lovers and moved various places and stuff like that. And then had completely pretty, pretty forgot about it. I hardly ever paid much attention to it. And it, the th the stuff I wanted to be legalized had all gotten legal. I mean, I didn't want to get married or have babies and stuff like that. If they want to do that, that's their business, not my, not mine. I said I didn't pay much attention to them. And um, all of a sudden, um, Tom from Julia called me and said, it's, uh, it's going to be the 50th anniversary of this Stonewall thing. I said, oh my God, how did we get that old so quick? 50th anniversary of the sip-in. Yeah. I said, I said, I said how did that happen all of a sudden? God. And he wanted to go to lunch, and I, I said, OK. So I had lunch with him. And then he wanted to go lunch again, and I didn't, I didn't really want to go lunch with him again because uh, I said, yeah, I've got other things to do. Um, I was working then, and, uh, and uh, I said, I've got other things to do. He said, well, we're going to go talk about it. This is very important. The 50th anniversary is instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, 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 that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. And then um, he said, you got to do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And so he gave a party on, uh, in his house. 14th Street, and uh, didn't tell me who was coming, and it was going to be like four to six or something like that, and so I went to this party, and oh my God, it's like everybody had died had come back to life. People I hadn't seen in 50 years there, and I didn't know they were still alive. I didn't know I was still alive. Gee, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. It's just amazing. It was fantastic. People, some of the people in the organization I really hated. Some of the people I don't like at all. Sometimes I fought with all. Sometimes I love them. But all the people I even hated the most, I, I was so glad they were still alive and I was still alive and all that. And we had a fantastic time. And the party started. It went on and on and on and on. And uh, it ran up late at night. And, uh, and uh, so I got involved. I met Paul then, uh, uh, this friend of mine, Paul. He was very young. He, he was only 29 years old or something like that. And he um, started calling me all the time. He wanted, to, he wanted to have dinner with me. He wanted to get to know me. And I thought, wow, this got to be bad news here. He's 79 years old. I'm 80. What kind, what kind, what kind, what kind of pervert is they having for a generation now? And all of these just nagging, 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 nagging. He wanted to meet me. And so I said, well, I go to church on Sunday. and. If you meet me after church, then I'll take you to dinner. And so we had dinner. We talked and talked and talked. It was very fa fascinating and very interesting. And it turned out that his point was he wanted, he wanted to write a book about me. And so we started trying to do that. And uh, it didn't work out because um, I'm, I can't do it. And he couldn't do it either, mainly because he's too young. 
because I, it's what, three generations, four generations before 1950. And anything I try to tell him, I have to go back. I have to, you talk about trap, and I have to go back to trap. Nobody knows about a trap anymore. I have to explain that. I have to explain this. I have to explain that. But over the way, he's become very, very, very good friends, and very good friends with Julia, with the, with the, uh, God, what's her name? I love her. Uh, Helen. It's, uh, Helen. Helen, uh, who, who runs, uh, who owns uh, the bar. She's become a very dear friend. And they've become very best friends now of my, of my life. These people are, are all my best friends. And now I'm dying, and, and uh, they, I mean, I, I don't know what I'd do without them. I mean, amazing, just absolutely incredible, adorable. Were you, were you surprised at how interested everybody was in your life and what you had done? Yes. OK, we're just changing, changing uh, memory right. cards. OK. So, Dick, in, in planning the, the, what came to be known as the sip-in, right. um, was that at all related to the sit-ins that took place during the black civil rights movement at, the, uh, at, at lunch counters? At what? At lunch counters. Was that, was that where the idea came from? I'm sorry. I'm when you planned the sip-in oh, right. to, to protest the fact gay people wouldn't, couldn't be served at, at right. bars, at least gay people who were known to be gay, um, did the idea grow out of the uh, sit-ins at the lunch counters during the black civil rights movement? No, it happened because of the sign up front saying, if you're gay, go, go, please don't go away. Mm -hmm. you know, it just, well, I guess, of course, well, of course it did. Because, of course it did, because, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely between the black thing, of course. But, I mean, it was so obvious. And uh, also, it was, it was, uh, that was so very, I'm from Kentucky. And I was back in the days of all that when it started happening, you know, in my, uh, and I involved in, I didn't involve in that, but I involved in a lot of stuff. And I knew all about that, and, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, connected to the black people, definitely. And at that time, were you in contact at all with William, William Booth at the? Sorry? Were you in, in touch with William Booth at all at the Civil Rights Commission in New York City during those years? I'm sorry. That's okay, I'm gonna move on to another okay. question. Um, so, you go to a, I need you to lean back again. Yeah, right. Uh, for the last 10 years or so, there's been a party every month right. at Julius's, and they call it the Manachine Party. Right. And you've been going for the last two years? Yeah, at least. And yeah. what is it like going to a party now that's called the Manachine Party at Julius's, which is the oldest <laughs> gay bar in the city? I know, it's amazing. Um, I don't know why they chose the Mattachine. And uh, I thought, well, Mattachine died. You know, it, uh, after, I, after I left, it pretty much left because uh, other organizations bought it. And uh, the, people, the people who inherited it uh, couldn't handle it. And, uh, and it disappeared. And, and actually, uh, three or four different or organizations after that have happened. And, uh, it had gone, and I was surprised I might still remember the name of it. But I was, I was surprised about that whole thing. Um, in the old days, we hoped that it was going to be wonderful and a great thing and all that kind of stuff, and it was going to last forever. But we were not guaranteed that it was ever going to last. And we thought that sure enough, sooner or later, the fascists would come and take it away from us and all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, Jack, my friend Jack Nichols wrote the gay newsletter. It was the first gay newsletter lasted every week, and it lasted seven years. And I wrote every page, uh, every every week for seven years. I wrote every issue, for, and I still I saved every word of it because I thought it would not be there. I thought people would never save it, and so I saved it just in case. Now I found out everybody has this on the computers, all that. It was still sitting up there right now. So and, 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 and all the gay stuff that I had back then, and all, and all the stuff that Craig did, we all saved it because we thought we would never see it again, that it would all be gone, and we'd have it. But now everybody has it, you know, as they should be. So when you go to the, I know tonight you're going to a Manachine party. What is it like at the party? Do you talk with people? Do you sit in a corner? Do people have questions yeah. for you? Yeah, we go to, to the party. They have just, they have, um, they have music. It's, it's, uh, <coughs> they have dancing and uh, and they have musicians uh, who, who uh, play their play their CD. 
and uh, I hang out there and and sit there and people come and talk to me. They have um, it's a whole it's a whole demonstration. There are pictures of it all all me over the place and and uh, old old things old ads on our New York Times and just the the articles are all over the walls and stuff like like that every place. <coughs> people come in and they wander around and a lot of people know who I am. Other people walk in off the street and go, what's this all about? It's, it's him, that's the guy, one of the people. And there are three people get in, he's, one, he's the last one who's still alive. And so they come and talk to me and tell me all kinds of stuff. And, and I meet people and learn everything and everything. And, uh, and the bar is a, a fascinating, but what, it's a wonderful place because it's, um, it's very, I think one of the oldest gay bars in the world, still going around, and the city, of course, still going around. <coughs> and um, it's convenient because late at night they make cheeseburgers, and it's cheap, and it's good. And uh, so it's not entirely gay. It's never been always all so gay. Everybody comes in and meets in the evening because it's a good place to go get late cheeseburgers. It's a good place to talk to people. And it's one of the fa one of the really fascinating because the bar is so strange there. There are people there who are 90 years old and people there who are very young to drink and, and they all sort of have a meet together. It's not, in the old days it used to be people separated and stuff, but it, it, always at Julius's, it's, it's always been that way. Everybody goes and everybody becomes friends. And it's, it, does it feel like you have passed the ball to a new generation? You know, that you did this work, and now there are young people, you have a whole posse yeah. of young gay people. Of course, right. Of course I do. Right. We all do that. Yeah. I mean, I, and not only that, I, I try to cultivate people. I mean, that's one thing, I, one thing I'm doing with Paul is I'm, he, he's the, I, I, I'm, I'm telling him everything I try to know. And like I say, I, I can't remember. I have trouble remembering things because I have, I can't what you call it, a disease. Where I, where I say words and I can't say what the word is. And so uh, I, I tell Paul everything I know, and of course he's interested, and I tell him everything I know. And I'm so sorry he's not here. And it's because uh, whenever I'm here, when, when I have to talk, or, or even when I'm just talk, when I try to tell a story, and, tell, and I say, and then so-and-so, and I try to, and, 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 and he comes right with the word. He knows, because he knows what story I'm telling what's going to come next. And I try to do that with everybody. You know, try, try to keep it. I try. I try to keep the word going on and on and on and on. Um, so, what does it? What does it feel like being at Julius's, looking out at this multi generational group, knowing that you were there all those decades ago doing this work? Is there any sense of satisfaction that what you had started <coughs> has come to pass? Yeah, of course I do. I mean, yes, yeah, I did. You know, that's, that's what we wanted to do, and we did it. It's fantastic, and I want to tell you that um, uh, as, as you, everybody knows I'm dying, and so uh, I had to pick a place where I'm going to where I'm going to die, and so I decided the best place. I'm, I've, uh, there's uh, Saint um, on, on Christopher on Christopher Street, the Episcopal Church. Saint Luke's. Saint, uh, no, Saint uh, Saint Saint Christopher Saint. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, St. Luke, St. Luke, the, the uh, you know, and it's a, the, it's a whole block on Christopher Street there, and they cover, and they have a garden church built in, in, in the Victorian, in, in, in 200, years, 200, 200 years old, and it's surrounded by a church, by a school, and a big, a big garden. And all the gay guys down there have made the most fantastic garden you've seen in the world down there. Absolutely beautiful. And so I decided I'm, I'm buried there. I'm going to be next to the statue of Jesus there, and also about right next to the garden. <coughs> and, if you're in, and if you're into religion, then you come see me there for church. And if you're not into church, then I hope people, when they're in the village, they walk past there and go in and sit in the garden and just enjoy the flowers and the smoke and the stuff like that, and maybe think about me and remember all about Stonewall and all the things we did in the days like that. And, uh, and what I like about this place is it's three doors away from Julius's and three doors away from Stonewall, and it's close by. 
And so, as I say, people can remember it and come and touch you and remember me. And um, also, I, I asked Helen, I said, would it be very grand, very elegant, since they are tacky, which just as often from anything, because I'm as tacky as I can be, but they have all their statues of me down the place and stuff like that. I said, would it be tacky to put a thing up there saying that I'm buried in that church three doors away, and why don't you go to the all go to the um, flowers and sit there in the garden someday and think about Stonewall and all that happened and how important it is to keep on gay life being real. And also in the corner of Christopher Street, it's the side of that place, is the second the second week before the thing closes. That's the first the second of the parade at there is right next to the church. And uh, so on Christopher Street every year when the parade goes right past there, it's going to go right past me. And I know it's possible. As, as possible to happen, it's not going to happen. But if it ever happens, if there's any way in the whole wide world that it's possible, I want you to know that when that parade goes past, I'm going to come up out of the grave and I'm going to say, Gay Pride, Gay Pride, Gay Pride, Gay Pride. Don't ever forget to keep it going. <laughs> If anyone can do that, Dick, you will. <laughs> uh, have you decided what, will you have a stone or a plaque at the grave? No, just a little sign of my name on it. That's just enough. your name, but nothing, uh, nothing written. Yeah. Um, if, if, if you were to have something written, what would you like? I, I, I thought about it. I can't tell you. I don't know what I would say. I don't know. I really can't think of what they would say. Uh, I don't know what I would say. <laughs> I've done so much in my life and had so much fun and done so much things and so much. I don't know, I don't know which one I'd choose and, you know, I really don't. Um, I'm just going to look at my questions a second and see if there's sure. anything I, I missed or if anything that you wanted to add. Um, just a question about the SIP-IN. Okay. Prior to the SIP-IN, were you meeting with someone from the Civil Rights Commission, Commission a, a black leader, prior to this, uh, the SIP-IN? Uh-huh. Were no. you meeting with somebody to talk about Mattachine? No. Uh, uh, we, didn't talk about, we didn't talk about that, no. We talked about, uh, we talked about uh, uh, police and traffic. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're, uh, you're talking about uh, John, uh, about Walter... Um, he, oh, he's an interesting man. That was an interesting story. He's an interesting man. Uh, what's his name? Um, crap, I'm sorry. Um, what's his name? Crap. Um, it's all right, Eric. Uh, uh, it's not important. He, he's, a, he's a black man. He. Uh, uh, in the old days, not William Booth. William Black, what, Walter William William Book. William Booth. Uh, B O O T H. Yeah. yeah well, so William Booth. Yeah. Uh, back uh, back in the old days, uh, John Lindsay was the first uh, civil civil rights thing, and in the old days, everything was racist in New York, and uh, the Jews owned schools. The Police, the fire department, the, the, the cops owned the police department, all that, like, and nobody owned the black people. And the black people were trying to get a part of it and, uh, and not, not getting it. So they were fighting with the racist things. Everything turned racist. Blacks turned to whites, French turned to black. French, everybody was fighting this stuff like that. John Lindsay said, no, no, we gotta get, we gotta have people working together. And he, she, he hired that man to do that. And, he, one of the, and as I say, every, every ethnic group was fighting one another, and nobody wanted a meeting where people had to try to be nice. And they wanted, they wanted that job for that man that John Lindsay hired, uh, Booth. And so Booth, uh, so John Lindsay advertised that anybody who um, has anything to talk about this group is, can, can talk and, and hear, hear what we're trying to do. And nobody, hardly anybody did, I did. I organized, and so, um, and I went to all the people of my organization, 
and plan, planned out things for him to read. And so the meeting came, and Bill, Mr. Black was very good looking and had lots of personality, lots of charisma and stuff like that. He was white, he was black, and all, a lot of black guys were in the white guys in those days particularly, and all that. And he came in, and all, like, all the guys going, oh, oh. And, and he's no dumb dumb. He looks around, he knows what's going on, and he knew that he had a power clap, and, and, and he knew it was great. And so oh, we read it, people, we got people starting up, he gave his little speech, and then we got the people out of pl plan there, and they called up and told about gay demonstration, how gay demonstration has this problem, has this problem, has this problem. And he says, I, I don't know about that. I didn't know this was going on. I didn't know this was going on. He said, anybody who has things about that, write to me about it, call me about it, tell me about it. That We'll try to make gay be, an organization, be part of the organization that applies to race and creed and color and religion. We'll probably put homosexuality into it that way. And he did. He spent. He worked very hard for trying to do, and he did a lot of things with John Lindsay and stuff like that, with police and things that, and and uh, fantastic. And that's where we met him from. It, it was wonderful. So you had the help of William Booth, who was uh, with the, the head of the Civil Rights Commission for Mayor Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So you had the highest ranking official in the Lindsay administration dealing with black civil rights on your side. Yeah. Uh, well, I was very lucky when uh, back back in the old days, everything p politically, the federal government was so anti-homophobia. -homophob all those Jager Hoover and all those people, they were so against gay people and stuff like that. And all of a sudden they had that big scandal when uh, it was about to be the election for John, for Ke Kennedy not Kennedy, Kennedy was dead, for Johnson to win. And Johnson had done all the good things for the race and the religion and stuff like that. And the Republicans were trying desperate to stop it. And, uh, <clears throat> and, um, and it turned out that, J. Edgar, that uh, John, the President, John, President Johnson's boss, who took care of her money, who took care of her money, took care of all of his job, he ran the governor. He ran the governor of New York City, and he got caught going to the YMCA, mm -hmm. you know, all that, and had sex with. Not only that, an old man beside the street was even more scandaling and all that, and so uh, the Republicans were furious. But uh, John Lindsay, of uh, President Johnson, was a mother. When he wanted something, he wanted something, and he wanted to win. So for three months, three th he spent three days. Everybody in America was standing up saying, well, there's not so much bad about homosexuality. Homosexuality did us quit. He became a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And then after that, six months after that, or about six months after that, he became president. And I wrote him a letter immediately and said, you said that you're the mayor of New York. You said that you believe that homosexuality is all right. And all that. Was this bullshit like a politician or did you really mean it? And he called me up and said, I really meant it. I really meant it. If there's anything I can do for gay people, I'll do it. John Lindsay said this. Yeah. He said, I will do it. Do you and remember he, what year that was? And, and he did. Mm -hmm. And, and any time I try to contact, they answered letters. Mm -hmm. or, he did, or they got somebody else to write letters. They paid attention to us. When we asked for things, we, we said we were going to put out the thing about entrapment and all that. He, he put out, he supported it, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he's, he's done a lot of, and and I talked to him a lot of times. I called him a lot of times. I called several times. I talked to him in meetings and stuff like that. We wrote letters. He would, uh, he would, I don't know why. Well, he had enough problems, I guess, to already. But he would never come demonstrate for us. That the, the, the Mattachine was always furious because he never come to, to our groups and stuff like that. But it, he didn't need to because he, he, he did work. He did work. Like, okay. like uh, police entrapment. He, uh, when, when gay people, um, it, it, tur it turned out he and uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Booth uh, figured out that uh, the way they fired gay people, uh, it was the, pre the, president, the mayor's obligation to do that. He could fire people for being gay 
he had found people freeing uh, commun if they were if, com if they were communist. He could fire people if it, if you were a woman who didn't have a husband, you could be fired for that, and all kinds of things that there were religious sort of things that were so he could change he stopped that. So he said, no, we're gonna start, we're gonna, we don't have to fire homosexuals. We don't have to fire women who are impregnable. And he just, so, he, but he, he always did everything he could do. And uh, so, Dick, I'm going to ask you a, a last question. Mm -hmm. Actually, two questions. Um, one is um, <laughs> this one. Okay. So, one question is: um, you shared with everyone that you're dying, that you don't have that much time. I'm sorry. So you've already you've shared with everyone that you're dying, and that you don't have that much time. Right. Um, what do you plan to do with the time you have left? What I'm doing now, talking to everybody. And I'm amazing because, well, there again, pr primarily because of Paul. Um, he's made such business of it. He's uh, turned it into a whole thing to keep me going around. He's called, the, he's called uh, New York Magazine, their publisher article this month. It'll be the, the next week or the week after, all because he did it. Um, and other people, uh, Paul, uh, John uh, Craig, not Scott, um, my friend, he, he wrote, he called the New York Times and said, are you going to do an obituary for Dick Lash? He's very important. And they said, definitely, they are. Said, definitely they are. And uh, all my friends, I had to go over. And Julius is called all, they, all the time, make attention for me. Everybody's talking, and we give these parties. People come see. People call to talk to me. You call up. I tell them. They come, and they sit and chat with me to tell me all the stuff. I'm getting to tell all the things I want to remember. Or they're writing it down, and I, I'm going to live forever about it, you know, stuff like that. And so much of this stuff I haven't, because I always said I was going to write this stuff, and I never ran around writing it and stuff like that. And so there's so much stuff that I know that I don't remember. And, uh, and I should have given, I have so much paper stuff here, and a lot more of some Madison, a lot of, most of us mine, some of this even Madison stuff. And since I didn't keep it for 50 years, I should have donated it to the public library. They keep asking for it, and I keep saying, no, I'm gonna write it, so I'm gonna write it someday. But anyway, it's not been written, and so it's still there, and so, Nobody has that information written down. And looking back, if I had given it back to them, if I had written it back, they would have used it by now, and it would have been so long ago that people would have forgot about it. But since I didn't leave it, I held on to it, now you're going to be reading it after I'm dead, and it's going to be brand new, and I'm going to go on living forever, finding whole new things that people don't know about. So it all works out well for me, doesn't it? <laughs> Dick, one last question, um, uh, and I think I've asked it already, but I'm going to ask it again. How would you like to be remembered? Oh, just as somebody who was good and nice and, and kind, of, kind of thought it was funny. Mostly that I, thought, that I was thought was funny. I always like to be happy and cheerful and stuff like that. And, uh, and you know, like, and, and it's, I don't know, my, my whole lot of religion, I, I, I have my own uh, theory about religion, and that's that, um, that uh, uh, Pascal, the, the Greek uh, guy, he said that, uh, well, he said it much nicer than I say it, and, uh, but anyway, he said that nobody knows what happens when you die. It's anything they tell you is crap, basically. It's, it's, it's your fantasy of what it should be and stuff like that. You have no idea what it's all about. And, you'll, and, and you won't know until it does happen. And um, so the best thing you can do, if you're a good politician, and, uh, and you're good, if you're a good benediction, the best thing you can do is presume that perhaps all that stuff is true about people being good, about maybe God and all those other things. You should believe about it. Because it could be right, and if it is right, and it does happen, you're going to be so glad you behaved yourself, because it's going to be forever and forever and forever. And if nothing happens to you, 
it's all gone, it's that, and you don't know. And so that's the way I feel about death. You know, if, if, if whatever happens, if I'm old, I'm 84 years old, and I've done everything I wanted to do. I used to love traveling, now I hate traveling. I've had lots of, had God knows how many boyfriends. Boyfriends are wonderful, but after four or five, you know, instantly they're turned into another boyfriend and another boyfriend. Anything you do in life you know, keeps going over and over and over again. Nothing new happens. And basically I'm bored. And if there is life after death, then there's going to be something new and exciting. I'm really, really, really looking forward to it. And if it's not there, what the hell? I won't know. I don't give a crap. <laughs> Dick, thanks so much for You're talking welcome. with me, with us today. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yay for the diva. Yay for the diva. Oh, hardly a diva. Hardly a diva. Thank you for, for speaking with me again. <laughs>